good friend of ours who's joined. I will invite him to the stage. Many of you probably know James Governor of Red Monk, um, not just a fantastic company, but a really, really fun personality. Oh, and a very dramatic uh, photo that I see in the background. Um, so you may know, obviously this is GitOps Stays, and you may or may not have heard the term progressive delivery, which um, we've been using a lot uh, since James coined it because it's kind of a helpful umbrella term for uh, maybe a lot of terms that you've heard already, like canary deployments, blue, green, AV. But I think because it's become a bit of a mouthful and you know there is a helpful way to use the term and the direction that the technology is going. We're really, really lucky and fortunate to have James dialing in from the UK at a very light time to kind of close today um, with, I think, a very natural way of ending as we're talking about GitOps. Um, as some of you know, know um, Stefan on our team has created Flagger that does produce progressive delivery, and it is sort of one of the many natural evolutions. So with that, I will hand it over to James, and thank you so much for doing the closing keynote. Great. Okay, so um, let's get started. So uh, thank you very much for that delightful uh, intro. Um, yeah, kind of a weird one. Um, you know, uh, when a term that you use gets widely adopted, that's that's quite interesting. So the, the titles changed slightly. Um, I think it's kind of difficult to talk about 2020 um, as being the year of anything without it being obviously the year of the Rona. Like any good story, um, this this one begins with rage. Um, so I was at a conference uh, back in. Uh, uh, 2018, you might know this handsome chap here, Alexis Richardson. Um, now, it wasn't him that, that made me outraged. It was all of the gubbins about Istio. So there was basically presentation after presentation, basically saying Istio, Istio, Istio. Um, and nobody seemed willing to say what it was for. Um, you know, it would be like Istio, well, why should you use it? Because you use Kubernetes, sidecar, sidecar, sidecar. And that really wasn't enough for me. I felt like I needed some use cases. And I got kind of ragey about it. Um, anyway, who am I? I'm Monk Chips, uh, James Governor. I'm the uh, co-founder of a company called Red Monk. So Red Monk is an industry analyst company, but we focus on developer-led technology adoption. So we're really interested in practitioners, the choices they make, why they make them. One of the roles um, that we have um, is that, let's get this out of the way. I just realized I'm seeing everyone off the screen. And one of the roles we have is to try and understand um, the, uh, you know, frankly, what these companies that are very well expected, very well respected are doing. So um, we live in an era where we're advancing the science, um, you know, very quickly. Um, uh, tech is basically an applied science. It used to be that competitive advantage uh, meant that people wouldn't share stuff. Um, and um, today, obviously, that is not the case. Um, I can go to the websites of people like Netflix um, and find out a ton about how to run operations and software development more effectively. This thinking about this rage aspect that I had though, I was really thinking about, well, what, what does it look like? What do these companies do? Is this something we can learn from them? And can we bring all this together? They use sidecars, don't they? They use this kind of advanced technology. Something about like Netflix, hundreds of production deploys a day, uh, very aspirational, and they test everything. They test absolutely everything they do. They test the programs, they test the applications. They have, frankly, a culture of experimentation. And then today we're in an environment where, frankly, mature product management process is, as Andy Budd says, one in which there is experimentation. And those companies, those massively valued companies, the ones that we want to emulate, they have experimentation cultures. So um, let's talk about uh, what quite often happens in product management today. You know, if we take this high level view, um, we've got the hippo. So the highest uh, paid person in the room comes in and says, this is what we're building. Well, that's fine, but mistakes are very often made. Why should the highest paid person have the best insights? Could we be more data driven about things? Experimentation is definitely a culture change. So those companies um, have, have grown up with experimentation as part of their software development and the approaches they take, but that has not been the norm across the industry at large, certainly not the norm in terms of the enterprise. Some of this came out of the culture of say like Google. Um, you know, if we think about Google Labs, as it originally started in Gmail, and now they've introduced on Android, where you, know, you can turn on labs, you can turn on new functionality, and you can respond. 
this is what I like about it. This is an experience that is good, or this is a feature that sucks. And that kind of feedback is so imperative in terms of, as I say, as we think about you know, making sure that we're actually delivering products that people want to use. Now, one of the things with this experimentation is it's a Cambrian explosion, lots and lots of features, lots of things we could deliver. How do we choose what are the right features to deliver to end users? Um, we live in a world of sort of A-B testing. We're thinking about, well, you know, we can offer some options and see what works, what works best. That's sort of content management, content marketing kind of discipline. Um, but the world of pipelines now and the way we're developing software, it begins to look like perhaps we can sort of begin to integrate these different functions. Growth hacking starts to look a bit more like software delivery. Now, we'd like to think that building software, um, it's like a factory. It's this metronomic process. Um, it's really effective. It is highly automated. It's like manufacturing, the software factory. Yeah, that's great. Unfortunately, it's quite often more like this. Memory leaks, galloping herds. We're not really in, in control um, of, of what's happening. We don't know where the error is. That's a huge problem. Why did we roll this out? So we're living this world of balance, quality, and velocity. And I think the industry has been very, very focused recently on velocity. Um, but it, it's not the case everywhere. Again, if we look at the enterprise, if you talk to a German automotive company, um, they're really thinking about quality as their primary reason for doing things like CI. Their thing is, look, you know, we're, we're highly regulated, um, probably more highly rate, regulated given some of the activities of companies like VW over the last few years. But velocity and quality, um, you know, we tend to think, oh, wait, those are separate things. But as we've seen from research from the folks like Dora and Nicole Forsgren, actually, you have higher quality and higher velocity from elite performing organizations. These elite performing organizations are doing some interesting things. Uh, they're doing things like testing in production. Um, and you know, there are various reasons for that. We'll get, 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 get to that through the talk. But testing in production, which is, it makes so much sense because you know, how do you know the difference between your staging and production? You know, distributed systems tend to be non-deterministic. How, how um, can we rest assured that when something gets rolled out, when more users touch that system, that things aren't gonna break? And for a lot of people, when they hear testing and production, it feels something like this. It's like, whoa, no, I'm not interested in that. So the rage was still with me. And one day I was meeting a, a guy called Sam Guckenheimer, works for Microsoft in the Azure DevOps team. And we had a consultation. And after a couple of hours, we, we were just having a chat. And he talked about one of the things that, that Azure did um, was progressive experimentation. And it really struck with me. I thought progressive experimentation, understanding the blast radius of a service to users, understanding the impacts of that service, that's a really different way of thinking. They would roll it out perhaps to internal users first, always segmenting, thinking about what's that user and can we afford to deliver this exper experience to them? And I thought, hang on a second, that Istio stuff, being able to do rollbacks, sophisticated routing, service routing, I could move some of the traffic to one place and test it, test it for the user, and that begins to look to me Boom, it's like a use case for Istio. Later that day, I was talking to Adam Zimmern of Launch Darkly. So feature flags, um, launching services darkly. You roll, you roll something out without, in fact, it's not even a rollout. You build something and you can deploy it without actually rolling the service out. You are decoupling some things. So we had a couple of vermouths. He said he liked the term progressive delivery as well. And I thought, okay, this seems to have legs. Key insight from Adam, deploying the service is not the same as releasing the service. What's been interesting to me has just been this, this ongoing interest from third parties in adopting the term. Red Monk, we're industry analysts, but we don't like inventing language um, because we don't think that's our job. Frankly, developers, engineers tend to come up with better terms for things, but it's been widely adopted. So Optimizely, they've done a big pivot, go to Optimizely.com uh, or you know, Google Optimizely, and you're going to see this A-B testing company is really going into back-end development and they talk about progressive delivery. That's the SEO term that they want to own. So this definition, it's not mine, it's theirs, but I'm happy with that. Progressive delivery is not about replacing CICD. Like we're standing on the shoulders of giants. That much is definitely true. A lot of the sort of things that I'm going to describe as being part of progressive delivery have frankly been disciplines that were written in the CICD book 10 years ago. Like, you know, if, if, if you know, it's not as if Martin Fowler, um, Jez Humble and so on weren't thinking about these things. But whether we'd really package them up in a way that people could consume, that's a different question. So, you know, there are some people that, that whose you know, approval you would frankly like. 
um, Charity Majors is someone that's like pretty aggressive. And I thought it was interesting to me when she heard the term progressive delivery, she was all over it. She was like, yes, this absolutely makes sense. We've got this complex thing, but we can describe it simply. Canaries, can I take some of the traffic, a small portion of the traffic, and find out if that canary dies before I roll it out more broadly? That might be for user acceptance, but it might be, frankly, will this service break? Blue-green deployments, the notion that I'm going to deploy um, two uh, identical environments and slowly cut traffic over until I'm completely happy that the user experience is one that's going to be satisfactory. Companies like Amazon have been doing this for years, frankly. Um, Amazon, everything is self-contained. They don't roll out anything across the whole network. Everything is isolated. They've got fantastic control plane, and they can decide where a service is rolled out and to who. But talking about Amazon, uh, maybe it's an appropriate time to talk about developer experience. Because you know Amazon is fantastic a lot of things. I don't think with the best will in the world, they would necessarily be saying developer experience is one of them. What are developers like? They want to use Slack for sharing GIFs. They want to be in GitHub. And they want to be using an editor like Visual Studio Code. They don't want to be in three environments. In fact, recently with the code spaces launched for Microsoft, maybe they only want to be in two. But I think this, this developer experience question is important. And then developer experience, GitHub, where do developers want to live? Oh, hi, Flagger. So when Stefan said, look, um, I, I, I'm going to run with this concept and I'm going to build a tool, I was really excited. Because there's one thing, you know, keynote guy, Alexis Richardson, says progressive delivery and GitOps can merge in a, a useful way. But when one of his engineers is like, I'm going to go and build this, and I'm going to build a tool for canarying in Kubernetes that links to sort of GitOps workflows that we've worked so anxious to get across, that was super interesting to me. Because obviously, CEOs are great, but engineers are the people that really make things tick. But it's not just engineers, is it? So GitHub, 50 million users, 50 million users. There are not 50 million developers in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there aren't. I know a lot of people have GitHub accounts that are not developers. But I think that's interesting because it's this question that the GitOps experience, the experiences about automation in and around Git, they go much, much further than just software developers. They're about teams. So GitOps, all the things, right? So we've got content. Um, Compliance becomes part of this GitHub world, uh, GitOps world. You will have heard about, um, you will have heard a little bit from previous speakers um, about, frankly, GitOps for security, um, for machine learning, and I, I think the the compliance thing is interesting. This idea of like a sort of a system of record for changes, because we can't let developers just be running around doing things willy nilly. That way, um, we're going to lose control of the systems that we're building, and this stuff is complicated enough as it is. So it, it went on and, you know, HashiCorp, they're like, okay, progressive delivery, we're going to do a keynote and we're going to talk about that as a basis for console. And I was like, boom, yes, it worked. Progressive delivery fits this service mesh idea really well. And frankly, I think that the, 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 the demo uh, Paul did, which was a, you know, finally a, a use for the touch bar, um, was an interesting one. Because it's like, here's a slider for doing our canary deployments, right? So that's a really interesting question to me because GitOps, um, there are, you know, some folks, I think maybe the folks at GitLab, for example, they'd be like, no, no, it should be an application. GitOps is not how we're going to interface with, um, with, the, with this information or with these systems. But that GitOps all the, thing, all the things thing indicates that it is. Technical documentation, marketing people, product managers all using GitHub. So GitHub, right? They've been using a, a, a platform uh, called Flipper since 2012. A guy called John Nunemaker built that. Um, so they do feature flagging for everything they do. Uh, GitHub has, has, has quite a de development velocity. It's increased more, more recently. Um, set of Ruby libraries, basically, for doing feature flags. So GitHub, this company that we all admire, this environment in which we live, um, they're doing this, this, this notion of progressive delivery and feature flags on an ongoing and daily basis. Nike, um, you know, fantastic brand, although the shoes they just sent me didn't fit, which is really annoying. Size 10 should be size 10. But anyway, they've got a library called Morai. They built it themselves to do feature flagging on the JVM. Um, Capital One, they've got all of these Kubernetes clusters and they're not all the same. So they've got to think about, hang on a minute, we need to do progressive delivery and certainly use feature flags to decide, hang on, before we roll something out to that specific system, um, you know, are we sure that we need to have all the feature flags turned on? So they're literally using feature flags for service management. Target, another really interesting example, Kubernetes shops, and they're mad. They've got uh, Kubernetes clusters in every store. Um, I say they're mad, but they've just turned in an incredible set of numbers a really interesting technology company. They went from like 70% contractors, 30% uh, in-house, to 80%, 80% uh, 20, 80% um, in-house, 20 uh, contractors in like under three years. 
huge investments in technology, Kubernetes clusters in every store, and they had to do progressive delivery because frankly, not every cluster is the same in every store and they can't just roll everything out broadly because it's not Google, it's not all identical infrastructure. Uber, um, interesting, they've got a library called Piranha. They're using so many feature flags when they experiment in terms of their users and the things they're gonna roll out. So they actually had to build an application specifically to work on feature flag cruff. So it's, it's specifically built for that feature because frankly, with progressive delivery, if you're gonna have different versions of things and feature flags are fancy if then statements, then you're gonna to have to think about how do we govern them? Stripe, Stripe is using um, strategies around feature flags um, and, 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 and certainly progressive deployments in terms of their APIs, because what, what Stripe is always worried about is the noisy neighbor. And more specifically, if the noisy neighbor happens and a service gets cut off, then somebody is losing transactions. That's hugely, hugely damaging for them. So they launch things darkly, and for them, they test everything, really so they can turn it off. The feature flag for them is about that um, kill switch, um, not for the service, but in fact, for the service being switched off. So it's the, I guess it's a live switch rather than a kill switch. Cloudflare, I think is really interesting to talk about them some because I love that, you know, we've been through cow and pets. Uh, Cloudflare has dogs, canaries and pigs, right? So dogs are loyal customers, the customers that they, you know, you can't afford to break their experience. They're paying you all the money. Don't roll anything out unless they want it. Canaries, yeah, at any given point, you're going to take one small slice. You might choose a particular city. You know, let's roll out the stuff for London, or maybe we can roll it out in, in Japan uh, when we're developing in San Francisco, uh, because if people are asleep, we can see how it will perform um, on the network before we decide to roll it out more broadly. Pigs are my favorite. Pigs are people that use Cloudflare having used uh, stolen credit card information in, in order to buy their services, and frankly, Cloudflare doesn't care. So they just roll out all the janky stuff, and of course, just because they didn't pay for it doesn't mean they're not going to provide signal and complain if it breaks um, or provide useful information about what is good and what isn't. And that's the thing. What works, what doesn't, it's a question of observability, right? We're going to close the loop because if we're going to be testing in production, we're going to be rolling out systems, we're going to be thinking about a Git-based workflow, something that we might need to roll back. We need to have really, really good tools for understanding what the experience is like for the end user. Um, obviously, uh, cloud um, uh, uh, charity majors from Honeycomb is one of the people that has done the most fantastic job of getting across this idea of, of, of observability, very much from the notion that it is all about debugging because you're definitely going to be testing in production. Eventually, everything is testing in production. There are no systems that you roll out that are not production systems. And at that point, you, you're always going to have issues. Staging environment the same, that's not going to happen. So where are we today? We're in a situation where like Microsoft is talking about, um, you know, frankly, we've had uh, two years of digital transformation in, in two months. Uh, Zoom is now worth more than all of the US airlines, the major airlines uh, put together. Um, that is an incredible sort of thing about what's going on this year. It's a very frightening year, but I think it's a really interesting time because there's change, changes in the air. Um, work from home, as Ellen Powell said, work from home is now just work. And I sort of love this because, you know, obviously, um, you know, the, the coronavirus is a, is a tragedy. Um, we've lost, um, you know, lots of people. Uh, I think the performance of the governments has been uh, a shambles. I mean, in a talk that talks about testing, um, you know, without any testing, uh, you're certainly not going to have good outcomes. But the changes and opportunities are incredible to me. So, you know, in Milan, they're shutting tens of kilometers of roads. London is widening roads. The, the cycling lobby is just having a field day in Europe at the moment. Because everyone's like, we can seize this opportunity to be more sustainable. Social distancing has led to actually better, more livable cities. And that's incredible to me. And that's the sort of thing that I think from a software industry perspective, we need to start thinking about. You know, we talk about product management is the digital transformation. Organizations have moved from, from projects, IT projects, to products, right? And it's experimentation is very much part of that culture. How do you do that? You need really sophisticated automation. You need to be thinking about GitOps as one of the ways that you can do this stuff. And that's across lots and lots of different populations. Designers are starting to use GitHub. Product management is part of that. Talk to Autodesk. They said they're using GitOps for automation. And I think all of these different functions, you know, you've got David Aronchik um, talking about, you know, machine learning and, and GitOps and how, how that works. It's all about fast feedback loops, giving you this, this compliance as well, because you've got a system of record. 
So it's about bringing all stuff together. And, and to me, I think it's about seizing this opportunity because frankly, 2020 is not really uh, the year of progressive delivery and uh, GitOps. It is indeed the year of the Rona. That means we're all going to be building a lot of systems and moving, I think, faster than ever.